Hi everyone, and welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel. I'm Ed Baker, I'm your host. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. Today we have as our guest, Kaylin C. Kaylin, thank you, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, thank you for having me. Yes. Kaylin is the Senior Director of Programs for both the Washington Heights Corner Project and the New York Harm Reduction Education Project serving Washington Heights, East Harlem, and the Bronx in New York City. She was the program and development lead for the historic opening of the first two sanctioned overdose prevention centers in the United States. Congratulations, Kaylin. Thank you so much on behalf of our entire team. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Before moving uh, to New York in 2016, Kaylin worked in Vancouver, Canada, developing and operating innovative, award-winning, drug-user-focused programs. <clears throat> Again, thank you for being, bringing your talent and your expertise to the United States, Kaylin. <clears throat> <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> I wanted, I, I thought it would be good for, for the audience if you could just share a little bit about what it was that got you interested in this particular field, working with this vulnerable, this most vulnerable population? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. Um, I come from a, a family, single mom family, and my mother uh, suffers from mental health issues herself. And, and the two of us, we had a tough time uh, when I was younger. And, and I, I fell into my own use as a very young person. And, um, you know, I'm very fortunate that uh, I managed to find some supports that worked for me uh, when, when I was at my most chaotic and at my most, uh, through my more higher risk periods of my life. But it really, my experience with my mom and my own struggles when I was young really sort of changed the way I, I, I felt about, uh, you, I should say, just as a sort of a, a bit of a disclaimer, I'm from Canada originally, as, as um, Ed mentioned, when we have universal health care in Canada. So if my mother and I, going through what we went through, struggled to get care that was relevant to us and helpful to us yeah. uh, in, in a country with universal health care, what must other people go through um, who have more stigmatized challenges than even my mother and I had? Marching forward in time a little bit to, to when I was a working adult um, and, and really had kind of come through most of my own um, drug use struggles. I went to then, I was living in Vancouver at the time, and I just remember just my jaw hitting the floor um, when I visited the downtown east side and just looking around and saying, something else has got to be possible for, for these people who are suffering so much um, with their own addiction issues and are so cast to the margins of society. It was really a you know, we often uh, in, in our work, especially in, in the harm reduction field, talk about the moment that the fire was really lit in our bellies for this work. And yeah. and moving to Vancouver um, and visiting the downtown east side for the first time was, was that moment for me where it all came together between what I went through with my mom uh, when when we were really struggling through um, our early years together and, and what I saw in the downtown east side. And I just knew that there was a better way uh, and I was very fortunate to land at the PHS Community Services Society amongst a team of people who believed there was a better way. Um, so I was very fortunate to learn from the best of the best uh, about what harm reduction and drug policy reform programming can look like. Um, and and I, I was further uh, blessed to be able to bring what I learned uh, in Canada to New York in 2016. Thank you. Thank you for your candor. I appreciate that. Mm. No problem. So the fire was lit in your belly. You know, it I was just, the, the for birth. better or worse, and I haven't looked back. <laughs> <laughs> the birth of, of commitment. Yeah, deep, deep personal yeah. and professional commitment. Thank you, Kaylin. So, you know, in, in America today, in, in Vermont today, there's a lot of talk about you know, the possibility of overdose prevention sites. And uh, unfortunately, there's a tremendous wall of, of opposition 
And in my view, it's based in like the absence of accurate information and, and furthermore, like the presence of stigma. Now, I'd like to begin there. I'd like to begin with you. Now, you're seven months into On Point in New York, an overdose prevention center. I'd like to begin with like an explanation, just a basic explanation to the public from somebody who really knows, who's, who's had this lived experience. What, what is uh, On Point? What, what is an overdose uh, prevention center? What, what happens there? Who's served? That's great. It's a great question, a great place to start. And I, and I want to start by saying as well that I understand, um, I understand the hesitance in the U.S. Um, there are no other overdose prevention sites in the country to look at. There are no other examples in the U.S. So I, I, I'm not somebody who shies away from um, or is frustrated by um, the lack of understanding and the hesitance around this intervention. Um, what I find positive is, is forums like this one, where the question can be asked and the dialogue starts. So for me, this is a very positive thing. So what is an overdose prevention center? It's a, it's a place, it's a room or a facility where previously acquired illicit substances or prescription medication can be consumed under the supervision of trained staff who will intervene in the event of an overdose or other medical emergency. Generally speaking, these sites provide the supplies required to consume the drugs and keep them in the site. That's one of the number one benefits of an overdose prevention center. None of the paraphernalia that's used for the consumption leaves the site. So they have a really immediate and tangible impact on improperly discarded uh, drug use equipment in parks and public spaces in the neighborhoods uh, where they're located. Two, they really focus on safety, stabilization, and education. So it may seem like a bit of a controversial statement, and perhaps it's too early in the program to start rolling out the controversial statements. Huh. But the least interesting thing that happens in, the, in a drug consumption room or an overdose prevention center is the consumption itself. It's everything, all of the beautiful support work, counseling and education and relationship building that can happen when you actually allow people to consume the drugs they want to consume the way they want to consume them in a safe and controlled environment. When that pressure is off, suddenly you have a captive audience and our case managers can get in there and our health educators can get in there and our social workers can get in there and do all of that beautiful work uh, to advance people to, to their goals. Many of their goals are treatment, some goals are housing, some goals are employment or reunification or family, whatever they may be, but overdose prevention centers are proven to be a very great conduit for that additional care, care and uh, furthering those that, that kind of work. Three, fundamentally, absolutely, without question, they save lives. So they pick up the entire instance of drug use from an unsafe, often public setting, and they transport it into a safe, controlled, and private environment. This takes into account the needs of the community, right? The community doesn't want to see public drug use. The community doesn't want to see people um, uh, you, you know, sort of under the influence and perhaps in danger in the community. They don't want to see discarded paraphernalia. All of the instance of use happens in a controlled environment, and our staff is trained to respond at the level of a registered nurse allowing us to give a very high level of care and resolve the medical issue, whether it be an overdose or something else, ourselves in the site. So this is an incredible cost savings to emergency services, the hospital system, and to uh, the police uh, and enforcement agencies. Well, thank you. And that's, that's a great place uh, to begin with a, a comprehensive uh, description. You know, I, I, I wondered about the, the because it, it seems to be a, it's a medical procedure and ethically you know it would seem that your staff would have to be adequately trained so you're saying that the staff is trained sort of along the at the same level as a registered nurse is that what i heard you say yes so this is something very unique about our program 
um, and something that we would hope should this uh, intervention be replicated across uh, the country, which we hope it will be. Um, we would hope that this is a standard of training that the other safe uh, consumption sites or overdose prevention centers will adopt. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that every staff is a registered nurse. I'm saying that we train our staff to respond in the same way and to the same level as a registered nurse. Yeah. Yeah. So we are relying heavily on oxygenation, oxygen therapy, agitation and other interventions, and we are de-emphasizing the use of naloxone. We're able to do that because we're there at the onset of the medical emergency. Um, to sort of drive the point home, um, I reviewed our most recent set of data just a few days ago. I think we're sitting at roughly 360 overdose interventions since mm -hmm. we uh, opened November 30th. Yeah. Of those 360 overdose interventions, we've only had to call the ambulance five times. <clears throat> That's like so, a little bit of a mic drop moment right there. I, I um, understand that. And that, that speaks to the expertise of your staff. You know, a lot of what happens in the community is out here when it comes to understanding overdose prevention sites. And um, I am a little frustrated with it. And, 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 mm -hmm. but because the information out here is so inaccurate. What you're mm -hmm. sharing with us today, uh, not many people really know. You know, sometimes uh, overdose prevention centers are called injection sites. So mm -hmm. it gives the general public this idea about all that's happening there is drug injection, when that couldn't be further from the truth. It seems to me that what you're saying is the self-administration of drugs is a point to connect with the whole person and then move from there. What, at one point, isolated the person and caused the person great shame because of an overdose prevention center is that same point is a place where someone's dignity is recognized, their worth is recognized, they're affirmed, they're engaged, and they're, I think you called it gentle curiosity. They're paid Respectful curiosity. Respectful curiosity. They're, they're paid attention to. Talk a little bit yeah. about that, respectful curiosity. <clears throat> okay, you might have to remind me to get to that because I just want to back up to something you sure. said. Sure, go ahead, um, go ahead. We're having a back and forth here, Ed. The idea of the safe injection site. Um, so the movement has moved past injection. And the reason that's happened is largely because we acknowledge that people consume drugs, uh, the route of administration uh, is more varied. You can smoke, snort, drink. Um, there are lots of inject. There are lots of ways to consume drugs. It also has evolved to include these other modalities or modes of administration because fentanyl is in not just the opiates. Yeah. Fentanyl is in the entire drug supply. Yeah. So if we look at what, what our, our original mission is, is to preserve life, to ensure that folks using drugs survive the overdose so they have an opportunity to engage in care or to work towards their goals, um, which of course you don't. If you don't survive an overdose, you can't go to treatment, you can't reconnect with your children, nothing. But we have a responsibility to work with all drug users, not just injection drug users. Um, and, and so our sites are polymodality sites. You can smoke, snort, sniff, swallow, or otherwise inject any drug, not just heroin and cocaine, anything, K2, crack, morphine, psych medication, whatever it is. That's so important because the drug supply in this nation, more so than almost any other, is incredibly dangerous. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to clear that up. Yeah. In terms of respectful curiosity, that's a philosophy that really encourages our staff to see people, but to see them uh, through a lens of love, uh, compassion, and understanding. Um, that act of witnessing, acknowledging personhood for people who use drugs is just, can be quite mind-blowing at times because nobody does it. They're invisible people in our society. So our programs and our spaces seek to undo some of that. And it's almost this act of convincing a person 
that they that their life has value and that they matter uh, and we do that through respectful curiosity so we check in with people we build relationships that are really authentic um, an example would be somebody comes in they have an overdose uh, they come in the next day, we check in, how are you feeling? Do you need anything? Uh, do you want to talk before you do your dose? Do you have any questions? How's that abscess doing? I know you had that housing appointment. Did it go okay? But really, like we would with friends or family. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so inviting them into a community to create that sense of belonging. The other thing I would say about our sites is that our overdose prevention centers are co-located within our larger program. So they're not just standalone sites. We have really comprehensive programs with harm reduction mental health units, social workers that do sessions booth side with participants in the OPC offering one-on-one -on -one counseling. We have medical care, nursing care. We have doctors who can do health assessments, primary care, sexual health care, medication assisted treatment. We have lounges and showers and computers and food and holistic services with acupuncture and acupressure. The point is to address the whole person, not just the consumption. Your consumption does not define you. You are a person with multiple needs and we've created dynamic programs that seek to address the entire person. This also means that when somebody is finished in our overdose prevention centers, we're not discharging to the street. Mm. We're discharging into one of our other program elements. And that's really a thoughtful, an intentional and strategic design element of our programs because we design programs for the participants that use them but we also design them keeping in mind the needs of the community where they're located mm -hmm. any smart program design for people who use drugs takes into account those two stakeholders not just the one that's uh, beautiful it's like the epitome of uh, patient uh, centered uh, care yeah, you know, and that's that's a thing, that's sort of a hill that I like to die on these days. This is this is a thing that really gets me going. You know, we have all these buzzwords, don't we? Um, especially in healthcare, you know, trauma informed care, downstream health impacts, um, and patient centered care or patient direct centered care is kind of one of the buzzwords of the moment. What does patient centered care look like for people who actively use illicit drugs? It's a thought exercise I challenge us all to do. It's a tough one because patient-centered care for people who use drugs necessarily requires employing harm reduction practices. And I'm really proud of the work that On Point is doing because we're really putting our money where our mouth is and doing authentic patient-directed care for people who use drugs with outcomes that are blowing projections out of the water already at six months in. When we first opened the sites, the Department of Health in New York City projected that one overdose prevention center operating for one year in New York City would save 130 lives. We've opened two sites. We've saved 100 or 360 interventions so far, and we've only been open for six months. It's incredible. It's incredible. And um, as far as outcomes go, I know that there were, I, I think you had said it's probably changed now since our last conversation, but I think there were 1,400 participants uh, at your programs. That's an incredible number of people who had been using drugs alone with no one yes. with them at risk for death that are no, now no longer experiencing that, that type of risk. Uh, 24,000 uses, I think you said? That's correct. And yeah. um, I, now it's up to 355 uh, overdose reversals. I'd like you to, no amb five ambulances, right? No, no police involvement. I'd like you to, no hospital stays. Can you, can you approximate the, um, the savings in cost that gener are generated by, by on point? That is the million dollar question, no pun intended. We don't have the exact number, but it's, it's, in, it's in the millions at this point. 
an ambulance ride, a hospital stay, a dispatching of a detective team, um, that's expensive. That's in the hundred thousands per person. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we are projecting. Um, we're working with the health, de health department and the NYPD and the hospital system to determine the amount, um, but it's projected to be in the millions so far. To say nothing of the system log jam that we're that we're really preventing um you know the emergency rooms uh are really in a phase of recovery post covid the healthcare system as we all know because we all live through it <laughs> yeah. together took an incredible beating during covid that system is tired um and healing uh, the emergency services, ambulance care workers, same thing, um, really, really uh, went through it during COVID and need a break and are recovering and are short staffed. And then the police, um, you know, the police do not want to be responding to overdose calls. They don't have the time. They don't have the resources. And frankly, you know, no disrespect to the police. They're not that helpful. <laughs> they they make it worse um so i just want to touch very briefly on our relationship with um law enforcement because i think it's important yeah, yeah. and it's, it's a question um many folks have how do you coexist in new york city with the nypd what is that relationship like i'm very pleased to say it's a partnership and it's very positive we went to the nypd at a very senior level um to discuss with them that this was going to happen fully expecting pushback, um, and that's not what we got. We got thoughtful and intelligent questions yeah. about how the police could partner with us. Questions from the police on, what do you want us to do in relation to the site? Do you not want us around? And we said, no, it's not that we don't want you around. We don't want you to do anything that would communicate to participants that it's dangerous for them to access the site yeah. because if participants don't use the site it won't succeed what we do understand is that you have a duty to police the neighborhoods where our sites operate and to respond to the citizens needs when they call you so we want a symbiotic relationship with you we are going to do our best to not call you but if we do we want you to understand that we've called you because we do need you yeah. um on the flip side, what would be really helpful for us is if you see people in the neighborhood who are using um, or who are in distress, instead of picking them up, call us and we'll come and get them. Wow. The NYPD took it a step further and said, can you make us a card so that when we're talking to those folks and they mm -hmm. see the card with your branding and your logo, they know that we're serious and that it's not a trick. They asked us to create a resource mm -hmm. so that they could help get people into the site for us. Mm -hmm. We, and of course we did that. Um, we did roll calls at both of the precincts in both of our neighborhoods. Um, and those were tough rooms. We were a little nervous, you know, very stiff, you know, the officers all in, in formation, fully expecting not a single question and that none of the officers would visit the site. Of course, the opposite happened. Tons of thoughtful questions um, about what the site did and what it didn't do, how they could help. And then every single officer from both precinct uh, visited the site and continued to ask questions. And they made sure they were literate and they understood how they work. And now here we are six months later, and uh, the relationship with both precincts continues to be very positive. That is really something. That is really something. It's it, nice it's, to hear that, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, very glad. You know, and, and along those lines, well, I, I do believe that um, the, your health department was was 100 percent uh behind you do you care to talk about that a little bit the health the health commissioner i think i do and this is really a little bit of a call to action we did not do this alone um mm. we are the provider who had the experience uh and the gumption to do it mm -hmm. but we had incredible backing and support from the New York City Department of Health, the New York State Department of Health, particularly the Office of Drug User Health and City Hall. I, I cannot overstate how invaluable that partnership has been for us. The bravery of the New York City and New York State Department of Health to say the time is now, this is overdue. We have an obligation, a moral obligation to 
acknowledge the status quo is not working to end this epidemic, um, we can do more and this is a part of the solution. Uh, they were lockstep with us on this journey to get the two sites open. They've been incredibly supportive since the sites launched. Um, and I just really want to encourage uh, other jurisdictions, other health departments to, to really look at what they can do to support their providers, their harm reduction service providers in their jurisdictions to do the capacity building, the training, um, securing the infrastructure and resources to ensure that these programs can take up the mantle and consider opening sites on their own with full backing and support uh, from the health departments. The burden of opening this, these sites and for advocating for these sites should not be on the providers alone. This is a public health issue and the health departments do need to come out of the shadows and say, we're gonna do our part to support these providers to do this important work on the ground. Yes, I mean, I couldn't agree more with you the, that the time is now. And, you know, unfortunately, I mean, how did you, how did you build support with the health department? Where did you, where did you start? We started by saying, we can do better, we need to do more. This is the path forward. So as, as a provider, as a harm reduction agency, we took a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes as providers, as CBOs, as harm reduction agencies, we, we sometimes feel that we, we don't have a stake in the game. Um, we're, we're sort of in the margins a little bit. And I would encourage providers to, to stand up a little taller and, and take on a leadership role with their health departments. We need to sometimes do some knowledge sharing um, with our health departments. And that, that sometimes, that sometimes uh, feels a little uh, backwards in a way. Um, but some of our health departments are not entirely harm reduction literate. And we shouldn't be afraid of teaching our health departments or engaging in a knowledge exchange with our health departments with the goal of increasing understanding uh, and capacity uh, about, about these evidence-based tools, because they are evidence-based, widely studied, peer-reviewed research, just stacks of it over the last 35 years. But sometimes our health departments do need us to lead. Um, and, and, that's, and I think that's really what we did here. We're fortunate that our health department said, um, uh, you know, sort of allowed us that space. Um, and, and, and we're very, very grateful for that, but it is very much a partnership. Um, but it really did start by, by saying, we, we want you to consider these interventions very, very seriously. As an agency, this is where we're going, and we, we really want you to come with us. You know, just along those lines, I mean, do you, do you have any idea about how many years it took to get to the place where the health department uh, would, would open to you? I mean, was there groundwork laid over a long period oh, yes. of time? Oh, yes. This, this predates me by a million years. Yeah. Um, I would argue, and I'm not sure everybody in the, the New York harm reduction scene would agree with me, but I think the vast majority would. The fight for safe consumption sites goes back to the ACT UP movement. Mm, yeah. Where syringe exchange started. Yeah. These are not new ideas. The first safe consumption site opened in Bern, Switzerland in 1986 and had an immediate, tangible, just off the charts impact on the community there in a positive way. Um, and, and I think, you know, I, every time somebody comes into our site, I, you know, we, we, I just can't help but think of all of the activists going back to the ACT UP movement, all of the people who lost their lives, all of the people who fought for syringe exchange. In a way, it's, it's all related. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been a, it's been many, many decades that people have been fighting for this. Um, in New York, when it, the language was developed around um, overdose prevention centers and bills started to be drafted and presented to the state legislature, um, that's going back almost 10 years, yeah, maybe more. Yeah. <clears throat>
Well, that's, I mean, that's encouraging. We've had, um, you know, and to see that commitment, that stick to itiveness, that fire in the belly, you know, for, 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 for decades, it's beautiful. Nothing happens overnight, and this is very controversial, but it looks like it's worth it for what's happening, you know, because of what's happening in New York. Your experience is so rich. Thank you um, for sharing it. You know, in Vermont. And we, what happens if I disagree with you on your own show? Oh, I don't care. Go ahead, disagree <laughs> with me. Disagree with me. So whenever people say, you know, how long did it take to get the sites open? I, I really do believe the answer I just said, that really the seeds were planted during the ACT UP movement, yeah. and it's been well over a decade. But then I get really frustrated because it shouldn't take this long. And, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. People in harm reduction say that all the time. It's going to be years before we get this off the ground. We don't have years. <laughs> we have to act now. And the amazing thing about a safe consumption site is that at its most simple, it's a table and two people. That's it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be anything complicated. If we wanted to open consumption sites tomorrow across the country, we could. We don't even have to build anything. Mm -hmm. um, and in our story, in the New York story, and I wonder if Sam, my boss, is going to kill me for saying this. I don't yeah. think he would. The window in which we decided, Sam and I decided we were going to do this, we were going to open the sites in partnership with the city and the health department to the day they opened, including hiring the staff, training the staff, writing the policies and procedures, and building both sites. That window was maybe one month. Wow. <clears throat> And I just, I say that as an example of when there is will, when there is political will, it can happen overnight. And I, I mean, I, I, you're not disagreeing with me at all. I agree with you 100%. I want it to happen now or yesterday. Yeah. You know, we, we in Vermont, we've been looking at this for years. There's been bills in the legislature. Um, there's been advocates, uh, you know, raising public uh, consciousness. In Vermont, we have our health department and the, you know, the, the, govern the, the, the state administration, the, the, the governor on down, has embraced uh, fentanyl test strips, um, safe uh, syringe programs. We've decriminalized the uh, possession of small amounts of uh, buprenorphine. Uh, we've, we've embraced, um, you know, every harm reduction intervention and funded them. We have programs. We have mobile units. We, we, naloxone. We have a lot of things going on that are very, very positive. The um, justice-involved um, population has, you know, medication uh, 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 for opioid use disorder uh, in, while, while incarcerated. I mean, we, we've come a long way over the years, but it's this last piece. This overdose prevention center or overdose prevention site piece mm. that seems to be standing alone. We mm. had a bill two weeks ago, H728, and there were, were you know, m harm reduction measures, and there was also a, uh, the creation of a study group to review the uh, literature, the research, to have expert testimony and to, you know, uh, document recommendations as to whether or not an overdose prevention site would be feasible in Vermont. We would be able to scale it to Vermont, how much would it cost, where would, would it be located. We know in my area, Chittenden County, we have heat maps showing where death is concentrated. We have mm -hmm. the mayor who has come out in favor of an overdose prevention site. We have the city council who's done a series of resolutions um, in support of an overdose prevention site. We have our state's attorney, uh, Sarah George, in support. We have our attorney general, um, T.J. Donovan, in support. We have, a whole, we have a whole avenue that's stacked up. The governor vetoed the bill, saying that it was counterintuitive to divert money from proven um, programs to something as, you know, uh, controversial and, and unproven as, uh, and he called it an injection site. He didn't even call it an overdose prevention site. And we have the health commissioner right with him on that, 
saying things like, the research doesn't support it. That's what we're up against in Vermont. It's coming down to a moment where, where there's going to be, you know, a lot of, a lot of heat about this, mm -hmm. because people yeah. like you and people like me are fed up, and we're, we're tired of seeing our neighbors die. So you got, you got yeah. me going there for a minute. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, we're, we're on the same page. I'd like to, I mean, I wish, I wish we could get together and, and, and come up with a plan that in 30 days. And I guess that's the next question. So you and, and Sam Rivera and your team, when you came up with this idea and you actually implemented it, you did it even with the Department of Justice, you know, and this whole um, safe house, um, you know, uh, a predicament. You, you, you took a risk that you would be prosecuted. How did, you, how did you manage that? I mean, because that's one of the things that's holding us back here. Great question. So we, as is very obvious, we do not have federal permission and we don't have state permission. We do have support from the city and the city and state Department of Health. We, Sam and I, uh, and our board of directors and our entire organization, we are incurring the risk of opening these sites in this political landscape. We didn't we didn't take on that responsibility lightly. There was a risk analysis that we did at a federal, state, and local level. Mm -hmm. Who's in power now, who's coming in, who supports the issue, who's against the issue. And we really looked at the various players. All of this with an eye to that 108,000 fatalities number. Mm. And really thinking, is, is this the time? There were a couple precedents that we looked at as well uh, before we made the decision to go forward and open the sites. It's probably very obvious to you what those precedents are. One is Rhode Island and the other was Philadelphia, the safe house uh, case, both under Trump. They were not as far along as we were. They didn't have sites picked out. They hadn't built anything. They hadn't hired staff, no policies and procedures written. And one, of course, as we well know, very famously, uh, the safe house folks received a, a cease and desist letter from DOJ, mm -hmm. and they're now uh, in, in the midst of a, of a legal dispute. And the Rhode Island crew was visited by the FBI and was sort of um, had some other kind of like threatening, um, uh, I guess, actions uh, oh. at, from a federal level. Here we were, we had sites built, we'd written policies and procedures. Um, we had been running an unsanctioned program at both locations for six years. Sanjay Gupta had been in uh, and had seen the unsanctioned program and did a piece about it and there hadn't been any interference. We, we in that moment said, what this signals to us is there is a conversation happening at DOJ around figuring out a way to allow the operation of these sites. And we saw our responsibility is to open the sites and make that conversation easier. So we needed to make sure that our program was very well designed and very well executed and that the work was going to speak for itself. And I think that that's, we've achieved that. Um, as, as mentioned earlier, the early outcomes from the sites are off the charts. Um, we have treatment providers coming in and working in the overdose prevention centers themselves in a way they have never worked with us before. Um, we are stabilizing people who have never experienced a period of stability in their drug use. We're connecting people to further care. We're getting people housed. And most importantly, we're keeping people alive. Since we opened our sites, you know, I'm not going to lie. There was a period where Sam and I were like, oh, God, what's going to happen? Are we all going to jail? <laughs> like, ah! um, nothing happened. No one came. 
Um, mm. There was a lot of media coverage. We made sure that we shouted our successes from the rooftop. All of that was strategic to make sure that we were making that conversation at a federal level easier. We have had an open door policy. And what that means is anyone who is not 100% behind us, has questions, has concerns, or is critical of these sites, we made them a priority to come in and see the sites. And I want to state this very clearly for your audience, Ed, this is an open invitation to anyone from Vermont government or from the Vermont health departments to please come and see our sites. We'd love to host you and show you around. But that was very deliberate too. There are very deeply held each of us has very deeply held feelings about drugs, people who use them, uh, the drug war, and, and our biases around, around this are, are really, really driving the bus in terms of what we think about safe consumption. Mm. And we fill in the blanks ourselves, right? And, and usually to the negative. We picture shooting galleries, people flocked out everywhere. This is a public health service. And when you come and see it and you meet the staff and you see the way it works and you feel what the room feels like and you see all the other supports, um, I, I'm, I'm convinced some of those biases will shift. Um, some visitors uh, of note, uh, the Southern District of New York has been through, Caroline Maloney has been through, um, senior officials at the ONDCP have been through. All of this signals to us as well, the conversation is happening at a federal level. Arm reduction was uttered for the very first time in a State of the Union address by President Biden. The mm -hmm. conversation is happening. Mm -hmm. um, the safe house ruling being delayed as many times as it has, mm -hmm. we feel, and, and so does the safe house legal team, that that has a lot to do with our opening the sites. DOJ is rethinking the way they're going to rule on that case because of the early positive outcomes from the New York uh, overdose prevention sites. Wow. Thank you so much. I can't even thank you enough for blazing the trail. And it's my fondest hope that, that Vermont will get right behind you. And um, I'm going to take up your offer on, on visiting. I'll be trying yes. to put together a team. I'll let you know to come down there hopefully the governor and the health commissioner and some key legislators along with some providers and uh, we would love to, to, to see you know, what you're doing more, more close up, Kaylin. Thank you so much. The time, the time is now and you know, mentioning the 108,000 lost ones last year, I mean, once you begin to focus on that, you, you can't really focus on anything else that we do have, and you said it, you said the word, you said a moral obligation, and that, that rings so true to me, that this goes beyond anything to that deepest moral place. One, one last question about, um, like the community itself, you know, like the building next door, you know, the apartment building next door, the, the bodega, you know, across the street, you know, what, what is the community saying about, about you know, having um, On Point as part of the community? <clears throat> We're in New York City. We're in a very urban, densely populated area. <clears throat> it's impossible for us to find a location for these sites where there's nobody around. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's also an impossibility to get everyone on board. Going back to that idea that we all have very deeply held um, feelings and opinions about drugs and drug use, and many of us have, have been impacted um, by drugs and drug use in our, in our families and with our loved ones. Having said that, the majority of the stakeholders in both of the neighborhoods where we work have, have come on this journey with us. I'm not gonna sit here and say everyone lined up and said, sign me on as an ardent supporter. Mm -hmm. There was, there were definitely pockets of real resistance mm -hmm. in both of our neighborhoods. Our responsibility is to stay the course with those folks and, and walk them through it. 
that's patience, lots of conversations, lots of transparency, making sure they know the team, inviting them to the spaces, undoing some myths and some misperceptions about the sites, um, and also knowing that there is common ground. We might not agree on everything, mm -hmm. but there, there is common ground to be found. Mm -hmm. One of the issues in particular we ran up against in Harlem is um, uh, is real and it's an issue that we actually agree is a problem which is the oversaturation of methadone programs uh, in a, in East Harlem a low-income area and there were some community groups in East Harlem who came out very strongly um, uh, against the sites when we opened them conflating what we were doing with the methadone programs mm -hmm. What they didn't realize was that the service that we're offering is completely different mm -hmm. um, and that we had been in the neighborhood doing this work very quietly for 22 years. Same in Washington Heights. Washington Heights was not a new program. Um, Washington Heights had been working in, in Washington Heights Corner Project has been operating in Washington Heights since 2005. So we were long-standing trusted providers working with this population in our neighborhoods for a long time. And that went a long way to helping us uh, gain the trust of the community around some of these newer, newer interventions. Um, but community engagement around programs for people who use drugs is never going to be simple. It's never going to be easy. If it were, there would be a manual on it and everyone would do it. It just requires patience and consistency and and being comfortable being uncomfortable mm. um these are tough conversations they bring up a lot for people and and we on both sides have to kind of be okay with that um so short answer yeah. the, the sort of the community groups in harlem who were very happy to talk to the media early on when we first opened um, and tell them how terrible the program is, have, have it sort of officially issued a statement saying they no longer want to be contacted as the official opposition, um, that, they, that they fully understand what the sites are trying to do and the role that we're intending to play in the neighborhood and that they support the objectives of the program. Great, great, nice work. And, uh, you know, I, I, I hear that part about commitment and patience and being there over, over the long term. Great, great yeah. work. Yeah. You know, so we're about to wrap up now, and um, I just want to—I want to thank you. You know, from the bottom of my heart, I want to extend uh, an invitation to you to come back at some future point, maybe when we have some research data. You know that we yes. can we can discuss and um, you know some more um, you know firsthand lived experience of what's going on there in New York. Uh, to the viewing audience, to my audience, I mean, it, it seems to me clear that. You know, our marching orders are very, very clear that we have to stay focused on this. We have to learn about this. We have to talk to each other about this. We have to talk to our neighbors about this. You'll have access to this show. Share this show widely. Share it with legislators, with neighbors, with family members, with people who use drugs. Share it with everybody. And let's raise our consciousness and not give up. You know, this is yes. a time for us to join together and use the governor's veto really as a, a source of additional strength and additional commitment that that the voice of the people has to be strong and the voice of the people in vermont we was clear in the legislature we want additional services for our neighbors who are dying you know kaylin we lost 215 vermonters in 2021 the number of deaths has quadrupled since 2010. And this is with, you know, granted the state and the, you know, we put all kinds of programs out. We have um, a buprenorphine program called Hub and Spoke, which, which, which other states, they would die to have it. It is a model and it's, go, it's going great. But we've not yet developed ways to meet those people that are still in the shadows the people who have suffered the pain of stigma, the people who, who don't, don't feel worthy, the people who have uh, been arrested and are afraid of being uh, prosecuted, or for whatever other reason are not sort of capable at this point 
of using traditional services, those are the people that I hear that you are touching, that you are having gentle curiosity or, you know, those are the people who really matter to you. And this is what has to happen in Vermont. We're, we're just below the necessary uh, level of motivation right now, but we mm. can feel it in the air. We're approaching it. So your contributions, I'm sure, I'm sure will help us. Once again, thank you. It's my absolute pleasure. And, um, you know, I would just say for anybody who is really worried about the scaling up of the overdose prevention center model across the US to to not fear this. This is one tool. We believe very strongly in prevention and treatment and all of the other pillars. This is one intervention um, that seeks to redress a needless loss of life. Um, and it's very, very good at doing that. Overdose prevention centers do not create drug users. They don't, um, they don't, they're not enticing to youth. They're for a very specific population who have chronic and relapsing addiction issues. Um, and they work very well at stabilizing that population and connecting them to care. So it's one tool that would be used in addition to um, overhauling and expanding the treatment center, doubling down on prevention programs, um, overhauling the housing system, creating op educational opportunities that are more equitable, employment opportunities that are more equitable. Um, really, really, you know, addiction as we see it in the U.S. today is a societal issue, um, and it's going to require all of us to come together as a society to, to start undoing some of the harms. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Cannon.